Here we are now in episode 64 of the Henry George Daily Devotional. We are going to deal with the final remedy advocated for that is insufficient to explain the paroxysm in industrial progress. George calls this from a more general distribution of land. Okay. Copy the link. Paste it there. This is episode 64. There is a rapidly growing feeling that the tenure of land is in some manner connected with the social distress which manifests itself in the most progressive countries. But this feeling as yet mostly shows itself in propositions which look to the more general division of landed property. See, this is what's frustrating. There have been many widespread reforms of redistributing the land, and they're very close to getting it right. But George explains how they get it wrong. In England, free trade in land tenant right or the equal partition of landed estates among heirs. In the United States, restrictions upon the size of individual holdings. It has also it has been also proposed in England that the state should buy out the landlords and in the United States that grants of money should be made to enable the settlements of colonies upon public lands. The former proposition let us pass for the present. The latter, so far as its distinctive feature is concerned, falls into the category of the measures considered in the last section. The last section being government interference. It needs no argument to show to what abuses and demoralization grants of public money or credit would lead. I think some people would like to hear those arguments, George, but that's okay. How what the English writers call free trade in land, the removal of duties and restrictions upon conveyances, could facilitate the division of ownership in agricultural land, I cannot see. Yeah, though it might to some extent have that effect as regards town property. The removal of restrictions upon buying and selling would merely permit the ownership of land to assume more quickly the form to which it tends. Now that the tendency in Great Britain is to concentration is shown by the fact that in spite of the difficulties interposed by the cost of transfer, land ownership has been and is steadily concentrating there and that this tendency is a general one is shown by the fact that the same process of concentration is observable in the United States. Yes, so in both countries the ownership is concentrating uh, and in both countries, there are already uh, interferences by government which actually uh, retard the smooth transfer of land. Um, George continues, I say this unhesitatingly in regard to the United States, although statistical tables are sometimes quoted to show a different tendency. But how in such a country as the United States the ownership of land may be really concentrating while census tables below, sorry not below, while census tables show rather a diminution in the average size of holdings is readily seen. As land is brought into use and with the growth of population passes from a lower to a higher or intenser use, the size of holdings tends to diminish a small stock range would be a large firm, and a small firm would be a large orchard, vineyard, nursery, or vegetable garden. And a patch of land, which would be small even for these purposes, would make a very large city property. Thus, the growth of population, which puts lands to higher or intenser uses, uh, tends naturally to reduce the size of holdings by a process very marked in new countries but with this may go a tendency to the concentration of land ownership which though not revealed by tables which 
show the average size of holdings is just as clearly seen. Yes, he's talking about uh, a subtlety in stats of averages. Um, so yes, he's saying population is growing, so it puts land to higher intensive uses. Uh, this may go on, a tendency to the contrary, which though not revealed, yes, okay. Um, yeah, he's also arguing that a small range, small stock range would be a large farm, and a small farm would be a large orchard, vineyard, or vegetable garden. Patch of land, which would be small even for these purposes, would make a very large city property. Yes. Um, I would rather own one block in Manhattan than 1,000 acres in rural Wyoming. I believe. I don't know exactly the tr the going rate of these things, but that's got to be true. Let's see. How much is 1,000 acres in rural Nevada? Land for sale in rural Nevada. Um, 860,000 acres for 13,500,000, and it includes... Uh, Holy cow, it includes an eight bedroom, two bath house. 860,000 acres. All right, here's what did I say? I said a thousand acres. 90 million for 12,000 acres. So you divide it both by 10 and it's like 9 million for a little for like 1.2 thousand acres 9 million bucks for a thousand acres how many millions of dollars how much how much to buy a block <laughs> of Manhattan <laughs> um, 1.7 million at the bottom which is more than not much more than what we we're saying up to 55 million um, it paid two billion for the full block yeah well there's two billion for that block <laughs> two and a half billion for another of course what year is this wait no no this is elite the other stuff was like currently offered on the market <laughs> anyway that was fun uh, yes uh, average holdings of one acre in a city may show a much greater concentration of land ownership than average holdings of 640 acres in a newly settled township. I wonder why I p chose that number. I refer to this to show the fallacy in the deductions drawn from the tables which are frequently paraded in the United States to show that land monopoly is an evil that will cure itself. On the contrary, it is obvious that the proportion of landowners to the whole population is constantly decreasing. And that there is in the United States, as there is in Great Britain, a strong tendency excuse me, uh, to the concentration of land ownership in agriculture is clearly seen. As in England and Ireland, small farms are being thrown into larger ones, and so in New England, according to the reports of the Massachusetts Bureau of Labor Statistics, is the size of farms increasing. Yes, as we know today, we have these massive farms with massive, uh, I don't know, scaled up production processes, which are killing us or maybe just getting us sick. This tendency is even more clearly noticeable in the newer states and territories. Only a few years ago, a farm of 320 acres would, under the system of agriculture prevailing in the northern parts of the Union, have anywhere been a large one. Probably as much as one man could cultivate to advantage. In California, there are now, far now there are farms, not cattle ranges, of 5, 10, 20, 40, and 60,000 acres. 
while the model farm of Dakota embraces 100,000 acres. The reason is obvious. It is the application of machinery to agriculture and the general tendency to production on a large scale. The small the same tendency which substitutes the factory with its army of operatives for many independent handloom weavers is beginning to exhibit itself in agriculture. Now the existence of this tendency shows two things. First, that any measures which permit, which merely permit or facilitate the greater subdivision of land would be inoperative. And second, that any measures which would compel it would have a tendency to check production. If land in large bodies can be cultivated more cheaply than land in small bodies, to restrict ownership to small bodies will reduce the aggregate production of wealth, and insofar as such restrictions are imposed and take effect, will they tend to diminish the general productiveness of labor and capital. Okay, I now need to caveat my co earlier complaint about these massive farms uh, that we currently have. Uh... It's my own opinion that we have all these massive farms um, due to a lot of government subsidies, due to uh, artificially increased labor costs, maybe at times, you know, high minimum wages, something like that. Uh, but also the cost of land goes up, up, up. So they're having to work a lot of far away land and they're not able to make ends meet if they are closer to a city. There's a lot less actual land available because everyone has spread out so much, which means food has to be transported and stored a long way from where it's going to be consumed, which means there's a high pressure on preservation and, of course, using whatever weird substances substances preserve food um and none of that yeah and it just so happens that that those seem those things those preservatives and those insecticides seem uh to be pretty bad for us but of course we've just simply relied on the FDA or EPA uh to protect us but it's uh, not a great idea to rely on government bureaucracies to protect us because they are prone to, as George says, um, bribery, uh, bribery, perjury, and all other means of evasion which beget a demoralization of opinion. Um, yeah. All right. Wait. This is... We want distribution of land. Dakotas, um... Yeah, so, uh... They start using machines. Um, first, that any measures which merely permit for sales of security would be inoperative, and second, that any measures which would compel to have a tendency to. If land in large bodies can be a little more cheaper than small bodies, as far as restrictions are imposed and take effect, they will diminish the general production. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. There is. Uh, what do you call it? I don't know, an optimization problem to be solved at what size are farms most optimally work depending on um, what the quality of the nearby land is, transportation costs to the consumers, and um, the cost of the land, where those consumers are. So definitely... Uh, definitely there can exist plots that are too small and some that are too big. The effort, therefore, to secure a fair division of wealth by such restrictions is liable to the drawback of lessening the amount to be divided. Yes, yeah, so there's restrictions on either side, I would say. The device is like that of the monkey who, dividing the cheese between the cats, equalized matters by taking a bite off the biggest piece. 
But there is not merely this objection which weighs against every proposition to restrict the ownership of land, with a force that increases with the efficiency of the proposed measure. Okay. There is the further and fatal objection that restriction will not secure the end which is alone worth aiming at, a fair division of the produce. It will not reduce rent and therefore cannot increase wages. It may make the comfortable classes larger but will not improve the condition of those in the lowest classes. If what is known as the Ulster tenant right were extended to the whole of Great Britain, Ulster tenant right. A custom prevailing particularly in Ulster, known as the custom of Ulster, by which the tenant acquired a right not to have his rent raised arbitrarily at the expiration of his term. Ah, uh, yes, I've heard this. Um, if everyone had this, which sounds like uh, rent control, it would be but to carve out of the estate of the landlord an estate for the tenant. The condition of the labor would not be a whit improved if landlords were prohibited from asking an increase of rent from their tenants and from ejecting a tenant so long as the fixed rent was paid. The body of the producers would gain nothing. Economic rent would still increase and would still steadily lessen the proportion of the produce going to labor and capital. The only difference would be that the tenants of the first landlords, who would become landlords in their turn, would profit by the increase. If by a restriction, yeah, like, like single-family housing, if you slap on rent control, um, in a sense, all of the renters are gaining this huge chunk of uh, ability. To, like, like there's this imputed rent that the land, that the land the landlord was collecting all this rent, and now they're cut off from that, and instead. Uh, that value is just going straight to the uh, the renter, um, and then in the in the case of like single family housing, the renter is not really able to either get that as money, nor are they able to like actually um, use their land very well uh, because they can't like sublet and they can't build more housing on their property and they are receiving this um, so so they're able basically they're not able to produce more in this um, world of uh, zoning which came after George if this piece of land they were living on they were able to generate a bunch of produce from it from how good that land was and they no longer had to pay that in rent and they got to keep it themselves instead of giving it back to the society, uh, then then uh, they would be absorbing that rent themselves. But, yeah. I mean, they still, in, in our current era, if you don't have to pay... Um, if your rent is two thousand and it should be four thousand, they're still making two thousand dollars a month. Um, okay, where are we? Uh, um, a fair division of man giving e to each his equal share, and laws enacted which would impose, interpose a barrier of, to the tendency to concentration by forbidding the holding by any one of more than a fixed amount, what will become of the increase of population? That's where we're at now. Just what may be accomplished by the greater division of land um, may be seen in those districts of France and Belgium where minute division prevails, that such a division of land is on the whole much better, and that it gives a far more stable basis to the state than that which prevails in England, there can be no doubt. 
but that it does not make wages any higher or improve the condition of the class who have only their labor is equally clear. These French and Belgian peasants practice a rigid economy unknown to any of the English-speaking peoples. <coughs> Excuse me. And if striking... And if such striking symptoms of the poverty and distress of the lowest class are not apparent on the other side of the channel, it must, I think, be attributed not only to this fact, but to another fact which accounts for the continuance of the minute division of the land, that material progress has not been so rapid. Neither has population increased with the same rapidity. On the contrary, it has been nearly stationary. Nor have improvements in the modes of production been so great. Nevertheless, Monsieur de Lavallee, um, all of whose pre prepositions are in favor of small holdings and whose testimony will therefore carry more weight than that of English observers who may be supposed to harbor a prejudice for the system of their own country. He states in his, in his paper on the land systems of Belgium and Holland, um, printed by the Cobden Club, that the condition of the laborer is worse under this system of the minute division of land than it is in England. While the tenant farmers for tenancy largely prevails, even where the more settlement is greatest. Whoa, this is a word I do not remember. More settlement. More settlement. More settlement. More settlement. Uh, it's not telling me what it means in English. Partition. There it is. Morcellement. Morcellement. Um, where it's great, where morcellement is greatest, are rack rented with a mercilessness unknown in England and even in Ireland, and the franchise, quote, so far from raising them in the social scale, is but a source of mortification and humiliation to them, for they are forced to vote according to the dictates of the landlord instead of following the dictates of their own inclination and convictions, end quote. But while subdivision of land can thus do nothing to cure the evils of land monopoly, while it can have no effect in raising wages or in improving the condition of the lowest classes, its tendency is to produce the adoption or even advocacy of more thoroughgoing measures and to strengthen the existing unjust system by inter interesting a larger number in its maintenance. M. de Lavallee, in concluding the paper from which I have quoted, urges the greater division of land as the surest means of securing the great landowners of England from something far more radical. I don't know what... I'm not sure what that's... Is. If the far more radical thing is better or worse, I'm not sure. Although in the districts where land is so minutely divided, the condition of the laborer is, he states, the worst in Europe, and the renting farmer is much more ground down by his landlord than the Irish tenant. Yet, feelings hostile to social order, M. de Lavallee goes on to say, do not manifest themselves because, dash, dash, I have read this before, and this is quite a crazy um, uh, concept. Um, yeah. While well, subdivisions of land can do nothing to you, it can have no effect. Its tendency is to prevent adoption or advocacy of these are the these are the more radical measures. Um, yes, what we're going to read here is that uh, it's easier to see the ills of monopoly when there's just like a handful of monopolists in the whole country, a, a specific landed gentry. This is an issue we have in America right now because 40% of our population are landed, so to speak. There's all these tiny little landlords, which are these individual single-family housing owners uh, that we call landowners, yet they're basically renting from a bank. Um, and then, event, you know, not quite. The, and then they, some of them do finally get there and end up owning it but it's such a small it's like because America's had all this land to divvy out over you know the 200 and whatever 300 years um, we haven't f 
fully concentrated a bunch of land. It's also a bunch of this super marginal land in the U.S. that all these homeowners own. Um, rather than uh, so, yeah, it's harder for us to identify a landed gentry, whereas England did, and England had a much stronger single tax movement in the early 20th century. So, all right, so here's what um, M. de Lavallee de Lavallee says. He says, quote, the tenant, although ground down by the constant rise of rents, lives among his equals, peasants like himself. Uh, Justin just made a comment in the chat. I'll read it after this. The, the tenant, although ground down by the constant rise of rents, lives among his equals. Peasants like himself, who have tenants whom they use just as the large landlord does his. All right, so you got peasants. They live among other peasants, but there are some peasants who have tenants. This is not the case in England. Peasants do not have any land, I guess. Only the feudal lord does. Or, I don't know if this was feudalism at this time. Back to the quote about the, about the uh, like, Belgian or French tenants. His father, his brother, perhaps the man himself, possesses something like an acre of land, which he lets at, rents out at, as high a rent as he can get. In the public house, peasant proprietors will boast of the high rents they get for their lands, just as they might boast of having sold their pigs or potatoes very dear. Letting, that means renting, at as high a rent as possible comes thus to seem to him to be quite a matter of course, and he never dreams of fighting, finding fault with either the landowners as a class, which he's now part of, or with property in land. His mind is not likely to dwell on the notion of a caste of domineering landlords, yes, a landed gentry, of, quote, blood tyr bloodthirsty tyrants fattening on the sweat of impoverished tenants and doing no work for themselves. And this is true of the little small-time landlords I know, including myself, sort of, through my family. Um... For those who drive the hardest bargains are not the great landowners, but his own fellows. Thus, the distribution of a number of small properties among the peasantry forms a kind of rampart and safeguard for the holders of large estates, and peasant properties may, without exaggeration, be called the lightning cock conductor that averts from society dangers which might otherwise lead to violent catastrophes. Yeah. It's, uh... Uh, the revolution is waiting, my friends. We are like lightning trying to strike. And the problem is there's a bunch of lightning poles, and these are the small landlords who are, who are similar to us. Um, yeah. Lavalais continues, the, one, the concentration of land in large estates among a small number of families is a sort of provocation of leveling legislation. Uh, this position of England being, uh, in England there's a small number of families that have a lot of land in large estates. Um, this position in England, so enviable in many respects, he actually says uh, people are like so, sort of better off in England with these massive uh, landowners because those people are actually s gentler gentler um, landlords than these small-time landlords. Um, and isn't that true in your own experience, right? When you rent from a landlord that's not super rich, I mean, maybe, they're really trying to make sure you pay rent every time. And then when I, uh, I don't know, I feel like when I've rented from in a big apartment building, I mean, there was a there was a property manager. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I don't know. Anyway, this position, so enviable in many respects, seems to me in this respect full of danger for the future. All right, Justin says in chat, doesn't royalty in England have a monopoly on the land? I can't tell you what royalty currently has these days, but indefinitely in that there's some. There's some YouTube videos by like Mr. Beat maybe or Brit Monkey. There are these um, 
where I think it's the Brit Monkey. Uh, this is only six months ago. This, this one, uh, I recommend watching. And that one, I think he talks about there's some little kid who like inherits like a bazillion acres of land, and he's like 10 years old. I don't know. All right, George now resumes. To me, for the very same reason that M. de Lavallee expresses, the position of England seems full of hope. Yeah, Lavallee says that it's easier to target a, a small number of families that have such large land estates, and this is dangerous. And then, he, and then Henry says, yeah, that's hopeful. Let us abandon all attempt to get rid of the evils of land monopoly by restricting land ownership. An equal distribution of land is impossible, and anything short of that would be only a mitigation, not a cure, and a mitigation that would prevent the adoption of a cure. Nor is any remedy worth considering that does not fall in with the natural direction of social development and swim, so to speak, with the current of the times. That concentration is the order of development, there can be no mistaking. The concentration of people in large cities, the concentration of handicrafts in large factories, the concentration of transportation by railroad and steamship lines, and of agricultural operations in large fields. The most trivial businesses are being concentrated in the same way. Errands are run and carpet sacks are carried by corporations. All the currents of the time run to concentration. To resist it successfully, we must throttle steam and discharge electricity from human service. All right. Thanks for listening. Read, like, subscribe, share, donate, comment. Uh, think about it. Come back next time.